Okay, so today uh, we will discuss, uh, we will start discussing path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. Path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. So let me begin with uh, motivation. Um, recall um, that um, the usual Schrodinger theory, um, you write the Schrodinger equation I h bar ddt of psi t is equal to h acting on psi t, psi t being the state vector, h the Hamiltonian. And uh, there the problem, um, uh, the problem, the goal uh, is to find the time evolution, which means that given um, the state vector at some initial time, say ti, find the same um, at a final time, say tf. Now, this, um, this is intrinsically non-relativistic, because time is obviously is playing uh, explicitly playing a special role. So time playing a special role. So the question that one would be interested in, uh, what is the relativistic generalization? of this. Now, in this context, uh, Dirac had a proposal, which we will be considering here in our discussion. So Dirac said that uh, the way uh, the problem is being formulated itself is uh, is problematic because the, the the way you are asking the question there itself time is playing a special role and therefore that does not fit um, a relativistic formulation um, so you should uh, one should have a formulation where both space and time even while asking a question uh, both space and time should play um, and should be on an equal footing so so his approach is look for a formulation where both space and time are on equal footing. Now, uh, the similar uh, situation uh, can also be observed in classical mechanics. Um, the difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics is in, in the way how mechanics works. For example, in Schrodinger theory, you are writing, um, writing a Schrodinger equation. <coughs> and in classical mechanics, we'll be writing a classical equation of motion. But, but the, you know, more basic, at a more basic level, they are basically the same, There's a, both of them are mechanical problems. Um, and, uh, and there also you can see this in classical mechanics, there are two ways of doing it. One is uh, uh, Hamiltonian framework. Where one is given uh, a Hamiltonian that describes the system, and uh, that Hamiltonian uh, find using this Hamiltonian you find the time evolution of the system. Um, that the time evolution is uh, is a classical equation uh, in quantum mechanics. That is the Schrodinger equation, but uh, nonetheless uh, these two are 
similar. So this is analogous to um, this is analogous to the Schrodinger theory. And there's another alternative uh, approach, which is Lagrangian framework. There, uh, the basic object that you consider, the theory is described by uh, what is called an action. And this action is a functional. We will see what that means in a while. Um, the difference between uh, the, the, the new thing that and the new feature that in this action formulation or the Lagrangian formulation is that you talk about trajectory in an extended configuration space. An extended configuration space is nothing but time added to the configuration space. So for example, if you have one degree of freedom, so you have time and then uh, space x and t and uh, and the motion of a particle will be given by some trajectory like that um, x which you could describe as a function like x of t now if you give some initial and final conditions say initial condition uh, uh, time ti and uh, x at ti and then x at tf is a final point, uh, then you could ask the question, what is the right trajectory through which the particle will move, okay? And uh, action functional is given by um, action x of t, uh, let me not put t here, I will explain the notation. Um, x is equal to dt, integral dt, um, um, ti to tf, uh, and then Lagrangian x, x dot and t. Um, and uh, when you do this integral, you have to know uh, x of x as a function of t in order to calculate the Lagrangian at a particular time. And then you integrate that function of time from t1 to t2, ti to tf. Uh, but in order to do so, you have to, put, you have to know uh, what the function x of t uh, is doing at ti and tf. So these are boundaries. So there are some boundary conditions. Boundary conditions is that x at ti say some given value xi and x at tf is some another given value xf. So this corresponds to this is xi and this is xf. Right? And this is ti and this is tf. So now you see, uh, mm, so when I write, um, when I write the square bracket X within the square bracket, then X does not refer to a real number, but X refers to an entire function X of T. This is an entire, this is a entire path from the initial and the final point, from the initial points to the point to the final point. Um, so that's the meaning of, um, of this square bracket, meaning of this notation. Um, and, uh, and action is not a function, rather it's a functional because as input, it is not taking a real number, but the entire path um, uh, and giving uh, out a, a, a real number. So, um, so you know, if you want to con compare these two, a function uh, versus a functional, uh, a function, say fx, it takes a real line to a real line. Um, so if you draw a curve, you can draw a curve like this. 
fx versus x squared. So what goes in the as an input is a real is is a point on the real line. Uh, okay. So usually um, uh, it is called the uh, domain on which the function is acting. The domain is the real line, which is uh, this one. Okay. And of course, if it's a real function, then also it will its value is a real number. However, the the crucial point to note here is the domain is a real line, um, and the specific value of the argument corresponds to a specific point on that on that space that is the real line. However, for a functional, is of uh, is square bracket x. It is not. Um, uh, is it? It is not a mapping from R to R. Um, rather, it's a mapping from a more complicated space to R, and that more complicated space is let me call it curly F uh, to R, where this curly F is a space of functions. Okay, so as I was explaining, um, uh, you have to first uh, look at, so this X in the square bracket is not a real number, rather um, a path connecting two endpoints. Okay, so this one, so this is Ti, Xi, Tf, xf okay now um, that space is infinite dimensional so let us let us try to have an idea of what that means um, and a, a more abstract uh, way of looking at it um, but nonetheless it's geometrical so it's not a big difficulty to do that so suppose so since i was saying earlier that x here when you write a round bracket x is a real number which means x is a point in a space which is a real line here when x is in a curly bracket uh, is in a square bracket then x is a path and uh, and uh, then that x belongs to another space f uh, that space of functions and uh, just like you, we had this real line over here we are trying to this is very easy for us to understand what this space is, but we are trying to have an understanding of what this space is, curly F. So let us uh, try to draw. Um, so suppose it's a cartoon. Uh, this is that space. And I already said it is infinite dimensional. We'll see why. Okay. So in that space, just like here, uh, in this case, real line, given one particular value of x uh, is the same as giving a particular point in that space in the domain, right? Here, uh, given one particular value of x that should also be uh, same as giving one particular point uh, in, that, in that space, f, curly f. Uh, however, uh, that point is does not is not a real number, but the entire path. So this x here. So let me put this x as a, it is a square bracket. Um, so this x within square bracket uh, it corresponds to um, this entire path. Now, what is the dimension? Dimensionality of a space. Dimensionality of space uh, tells you how many um, independent directions you could move the original point to. So this is your point. This is your original point. In how many independent directions could you move? So in on this piece, on this flat space, surface, we of course have two independent directions because it's two-dimensional space. But we are trying to imagine that it can be larger. 
for example, in case of three dimension, we draw a thing like this. Uh, this is with a perspective, we can imagine that it's a three dimensional space. Uh, for four dimension, we cannot imagine, but we can be a little more abstract to probe this question. The, the, the more abstract question that you can ask is, um, the, it's, it's a number of ways, um, it's a number of directions, independent directions are the number of independent um, directions in which the move part, this point can move. And the, this point moving means this function is changing because this point represents uh, this function or the path. So you could ask the question, uh, in how many ways could I change, modify this path? And there are an infinite number of ways because at each point you could make a change and at each point, and that will be an independent change. As a result, you will be able to get, um, these are the neighboring paths. So those neighboring paths, um, if you wanted to classify uh, how they are different, they can be, they can differ from the original path in infinite number of ways. Because at each point you have a degree of freedom of modifying the modifying the curve. Okay. So therefore, there should be in infinite number of independent directions in along which uh, the, the point could move. Right. So the picture that I'm trying to give is that one specific path, one specific function, x of t, is represented by a point here. And the neighboring paths with the same boundary conditions will be given by neighboring points uh, around that point, okay? And there, since there are an in infinite number of independent uh, directions you could go, uh, it's an infinite dimensional space, okay? So I hope um, this concept of functional is clear now. So uh, whatever uh, I we were doing about functions in, in this, uh, um, in this in this uh, real line case, um, you are basically considering a function on if, and that's a functional, okay? Because when you uh, when you when you refer to this argument x, that doesn't actually refer to a point. That does that is not a description of a point in f. It is by the square bracket you tell them. Uh, tell people that um, this corresponds to the argument is of entire path, which is a point in F. Okay, so, um, so question would be then uh, this, uh, since in this uh, way of describing the mechanics, uh, you are only considering paths in an extended configuration space, both space and time, seem to be treated on an equal footing. Question is that could we have a reformulation of quantum mechanics in terms of action? 